This is a Saddleback Church podcast. Well, friends, it's the one you've all been waiting for. If you've been following along with this Navigating the Bible series, you've undoubtedly been waiting for an episode focused on Revelation. Now, perhaps you have read Revelation before and were left confused and befuddled over what was unfolding across those pages. Or perhaps you found yourself fascinated and wanting to look through all of the possible meanings of the images in the book. Or perhaps you've never read the book for one reason or another. Well, buckle up, because today we've got Pastor Tom Holliday to help navigate how we should read Revelation. Tom was a teaching pastor at Saddleback Church for many, many years, and he hosts the Drive Time Devotions podcast, which is also part of the Saddleback family of podcasts, where he has walked through nearly every book of the Bible, including Revelation. So in this conversation, Tom helps us look at the true heart and message found in the book of Revelation, and how we can read it in a way that will impact your life today. My name is Jason Whelan, and this is Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast, part of the Saddleback family of podcasts. Now, my conversation with Pastor Tom Holliday. Tom Holliday, thanks for joining me again. You've been a, a Doable Discipleship figure over the years. So thanks Who wouldn't for, want to be here? <laughs> thanks for joining us to talk about Revelation today. So like I've started every other um, episode of this series talking about navigating the Bible, could you just set the stage for us as we're talking about this, this last book of the New Testament, R- Revelation? What can you tell us about the author, when it was written, just any basic important details that would be helpful to get our feet wet? Well, I, I noticed you didn't invite me in to do the Gospels, which, you know, you know I get I, to do the book of Revelation. Well, when I was looking so, at them, we, we said specifically, ah, I got to get Tom in for that yeah. one. <laughs> and so I'm not going to do, I mean, those of you that are uh, are, li- are listening or reading through with Saddleback right now, mm-hmm. uh, you're, you're getting a good longer introduction to Revelation in that. So I'm, a, I'm just going to give a very brief overview. Uh, so you've got John. The early disciple of Jesus, the disciple that Jesus loved. He's in old age now, mm-hmm. and uh, God is speaking to him, and he shows him a revelation. He opens up the doors of heaven, and he shows him something, Yeah. and John writes it down, and we get to read it. So uh, it's called the revelation of John sometimes, but it's really the revelation of God mm. to John that we get to read. And he's talking to churches during a time of persecution, and he's giving them hope, mm. giving them God's hope. If you've read the book of Revelation at all, you know that that (laughs) hope is given, and we're going to talk about that, I hope, today. Yes. I think today. uh, That hope is given through a different kind of uh, writing than anywhere else in the New Testament. You see some in the Old Testament in books like Daniel and a couple of other places. So this apocryphal writing or this writing that revolves around pictures and numbers that represent how God's at work in the world today it can seem confusing at first, but as we get into it, I think in uh, this brief podcast, we'll be able to clear <laughs> away some of the clouds. <laughs> well, that's good, because I, I imagine that most people listening, if you have read Revelation, then you are jumping at this being like, what am I getting myself into? I have no idea. <laughs> and so being able to talk it through, talk about what it means to be reading um, apocalyptic literature and all that stuff. We are definitely getting that. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to, to give you some ease. Yes, yes we will be yes. getting to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but for right now, as we're still looking at setting this stage a little bit, what can you tell us about the cultural context of when Revelation was written and how can understanding the culture of that time help us reading Revelation? Well, it's the early church, as I said just a minute ago, uh, and they've begun to be persecuted like never before. Yeah. They've gone through times of persecution, but they're going through some of their worst persecution. You know, under the Caesars, they suffered persecution after persecution after persecution. And uh, they're having to face up to the fact that this world is not all there is, that yeah. if they put all their hope in this world, 
that's not a place to put your hope. And so Revelation reveals, God reveals to them where we're supposed to put our hope, mm. where we stand as followers of Jesus Christ. And so in that sense, uh, the cultural context of Revelation is the same as so many believers in so many ages. Mm. And in, in every age, we face some kind of persecution. Uh, they were facing the worst of, of, of persecution. They were losing their lives for their faith. Churches were being torn apart because of their faith, only to be put back together by God in another place. And so when you read Revelation, you're reading how God gives hope to people that are facing a hopeless situation in this world, mm -hmm. but have ultimate hope in God, always, not only in this world, but also in eternity. Mm. So yeah, so that's that's great context because it's it's it was true for them and it's true for us now that that what God is giving us in this book is this ability to look into the future with hope, yes. to see ahead, yes, to, uh, to see the victory in Christ, and to see what that looks like in hope. Yes, and I'm, I'm not going into some of the details like the Caesars like Nero earlier <laughs> and Domitian later who, who brought about the persecutions. Sure. Uh, those were just the human agents that Satan was using yeah. to persecute the church. Uh, the human agent isn't what's so important. Mm -hmm. What's important is that we know that there is an evil power at work in this world that's trying to destroy what God has done, but he's not going to win. Mm -hmm. He can't possibly win, and that's what Revelation is all about. Love it. So, so you mentioned that that there's some specialness in this book when we're talking about apocalyptic literature. So, what can you tell us about what this means and how to read it? You mentioned that there's some Old Testament um, uses of this genre too. So, what can you tell us about how do we approach reading like this? So, when you read the Book of Revelation, you're going to read uh, numbers and you're going to read pictures. Uh, numbers like the number seven, mm -hmm. or the number 14,000, or the number 12, or the number 666, all these numbers that you read, and all these pictures that you read, like you've got locusts, and you've got pale horses, and red horses, and what, is, what does it all mean? Yeah. And what, what can really help in your understanding when you read Revelation is knowing that these were pictures that were familiar to the people then, mm. and they know, knew what they meant. It's not like they didn't mean anything to them then. And then finally, now at the end of the age, we can figure out what all these pictures, they meant clear things to them then. And the, the, the clearest picture I can give, I think, people today for the book of Revelation, it's sort of like, it's not this, but it's sort of like a political cartoon that you would read today. Mm. If, if as an American, you read a political cartoon, you're going to understand certain things. Yeah. If you see a political cartoon and it's got a donkey and an elephant in it, you know what that means. Yeah. You have no <laughs> doubt what that means. But just suppose 2,000 years from now, somebody's trying to look back on America and they see this political cartoon, they find it, and they try to figure out 2,000 years later, the donkey means this and the elephant means this. <laughs> and the reason the donkey is riding the elephant is this. <laughs> and they just make it up out of their head based on their current culture. It would be very confusing. Yeah. So you go back, let me give you one illustration. All For right, sure. you wanna start with a good one? Please. Let's start with the beast. I mean, there why not, go. right? You know? <laughs> That's what everybody's <laughs> so, been waiting for, so Tom, start, you knew it. <laughs> so let's start with Re Revelation 13, one to four, talks about this beast, this ruler over the world, mm -hmm that's gonna act like they're God, but not be God, and lead us all in the wrong direction. Uh, 10 horns this beast has, seven heads and seven crowns. The, the beast resembles a leopard in these verses, a bear and a lion. One of its heads seems to have a fatal wound. These are all obvious pictures, mm. and, and I'll tell you why we get confused in just a minute, but 10 horns, horns were a sign of power. Mm -hmm. 10 was a sign of completeness. So it, this is a, someone who seemed to have complete power. Seven is also a number of power, seven heads and seven crowns. So they have been given power over mankind in some way because mankind's given them this power, has mm -hmm. followed this person who is anti-God and against God, anti-Christ and, and anti-Christ. Uh, a, a leopard, a, a bear, a lion. Again, all, all signs of power. These, mm -hmm. these are, this is a ruler who has power over the world. And one of its heads seems to have a fatal wound. That means that power is not going to last. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's going to last, but it's not going to last. Mm -hmm. So here's where we get into trouble, everybody that's listening. <laughs> we try to read in from today what all of this meant. Like, oh, 
oh, this meant something back then, obviously, but today maybe it means something. So we try to figure out, maybe it means 10, maybe that means 10 nations. Well, it could, mm -hmm. but that's just a guess. That's just a guess. There is, um, when you talk about being uh, faithful to God's word, there's orthodoxy, unorthodoxy, and hyper-orthodoxy. <laughs> you didn't know you were gonna learn theology today. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> orthodoxy is the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. Unorthodoxy is going opposite to the truth of God's word, saying that God is not our father, saying that Jesus is not God. Mm -hmm. Those are unorthodox statements. Hyper-orthodoxy is going outside the truth of God's word. Mm. So that's when you say, uh, well, the 10, the ten uh, heads, horns have to mean 10 countries. You know, when I was a, first a believer, there, were, there happened to be 10 countries in the European Union. There uh -oh. aren't any more. Yeah. So everybody said, that's it. <laughs> there we, we go. Got it figured it's out. happening. <laughs> you know, and they, they see this thing like they had a fatal wound on their head. I'm talking about ones that can't be true now. People used to say, oh, that must mean JFK. Oh, sure. He got shot in the head. He's going to rise from the dead somehow. People actually said this. <laughs> and later they said, it's Gorbachev. If you know mm -hmm. anything about history, he had this big... Uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a freckle. It was yeah, a, <laughs> a little bit more than that. <laughs> it looked like a wound on his head, but it was just a, 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 a facial blemish. Yeah. And yet people said, that must be him. They're just guessing. Mm. They're just guessing. And it's like uh, there were many prophecies of Jesus before he came, but they didn't know it was Jesus until Jesus actually came. Yeah. That's when they knew it was Jesus. And then even everybody didn't recognize it then, mm. but some did. It wasn't until after he was resurrected that the disciples really recognized the Old Testament prophecy about, prophecies about Jesus. And so one of the reasons we get confused about Revelation is because there's so many guesses out there. Mm -hmm. And could some, some of them be right? I suppose so, you know, yeah. but also a lot of them have been proven to be wrong. There have been so many guesses about who this beast was. Uh, it was obvious to believers that Hitler was the beast during World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people who believed it was Ronald Reagan because yeah. Ronald Wilson Reagan, 666. Six, six. <laughs> so they were all convinced that it was that. So they just play mind games and numbers games. But really what this means is that there was, there is a power in the world that's anti-God. Yeah, And Jesus told us that there would be antichrist before this final antichrist and john told us in his letters that the antichrist had already come now not this final antichrist but anytime someone sets them up as a power yeah. against god and leads people away from christ that person is according to the new testament an, an, an antichrist so what i would say that and i know i'm talking a lot now Please, at the beginning th of this, this but, is the point <laughs> so uh, b because the book of Revelation is filled with pictures, we tend sometimes to make the simple complex and the complex simple. So what I want to encourage you to do as you read the book of Revelation is just hear the simple truths that are in there. The, the, the point is that the beast of Revelation and the truth of that beast, the reason that God put the book of Revelation in the New Testament is because it's a truth that believers of all ages need. Mm. So I would say... If you look at this pictures of the beast, there are some pictures that obviously have to do with Rome and the day of uh, seven hills yeah. and some things like that. But there's also some pictures that have to do with the end of time. Mm. But there's also some pictures that have to do with every believer that lived in all times. So if, if you read the book of Revelation and you miss the point that it gave hope to the believers who first read it, who were being persecuted by Rome, you've missed the point of the book of Revelation. Mm. If you read the book of Revelation and you miss the point that it's written to give hope to all believers over the last 2,000 years who've suffered persecution over, over government power, selfish powers, you've missed the point. And if you read the book of Revelation and you miss the point that it's written to give hope at the end of the ages when everything's gonna fall apart, when people are gonna choose either to follow Christ or to follow their own way, then you've missed the point. All of those things are true. And I think once you get the that in your mind, it's written to give hope to believers of all ages, mm -hmm. is very helpful. Now, I know it's hard to sort that out from, yeah, but really, don't the locusts <laughs> represent Apache attack helicopters? Yeah. I mean, isn't that what they represent? Well, I guess somebody could be right about that, but it's just a guess. Mm -hmm. There is nothing in the Bible that tells us that that guess is true. So if they are right, it's just luck. It's mm. not Bible study. Mm. That's... It's Again, such great advice and encouragement uh, that you can read 
read this book and don't try to parse everything. Don't try to make your own guesses as to, hey, like if this were to happen tomorrow, if, you know, like this could be this, this could be this. Like that's, as you said, it's kind of missing the point. You're missing the forest yes. for the trees a yes. little bit in this. <clears throat> yes. So how have people viewed Revelation different over time? How they approach? So I, I would say what I just shared is not yeah. how everybody has I've shared my viewpoint of the book of Revelation, sure. that it has truth and hope for believers of all ages. Uh, that's not how everybody has necessarily viewed it. Sure. There are some, and I'll give you some more big words. Great. The, the word preterist means that it was written just about Rome. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with, with what's going to happen at the end of time. There are some believers who believe that. They would also believe that in reading it about Rome, you can find hope for your circumstances today, but it's just about what happened in the past. I, I don't believe that, but there are some good, strong believers mm. who do believe that. There are others who believe, and I'd call this more like the idealist position, that it's not about Rome, it's not about the end of time, it's just these pictures of how God works. So everything is symbolic in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Nothing is real. I have a hard time with that one, honestly, because so much is so clearly about Rome. Sure. So much seems to point so clearly to what's going to happen in the future. But there are some believers who have believed that. I, I, you know, so just to show my prejudice on this one, <laughs> I, I would call, there's also a, a more a realist, mm -hmm. you know, that this is about truth in, that's going to happen in the real world and how God can give us real hope in the midst of real problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the book of Revelation is a book filled with hope but it's also realistic hope. It's not, it's not this kind of kumbaya kind of hope where everything's <laughs> gonna turn out okay in the end if we just yeah. trust in Jesus. And we're just gonna get better and better and better and better. The book of Revelation says, no, it's gonna get worse at the end. Mm. The world's gonna fall apart at the end, and then God's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth. And that's a hard picture for mm. some believers to accept, even believers, because yeah. we don't wanna go through that kind of time. We don't want anybody to go through that kind of a time, but that's the picture the book of Revelation gives us. Mm. That's, uh, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, so many things I could, but yes. <laughs> so I, I, wanted to, I wanted to go back to this idea of, of theme a little bit, because we've talked about hope as yes. this primary theme. Are there any other themes that are important to, to look out for as people are approaching Revelation? Well, yes. I mean, you, uh, if you take a look at the book, but the first three chapters are messages to the churches. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is written to the church and we're supposed to read it. And many of those messages are warnings about us falling away during difficult times, about us trusting in ourselves, about us losing our first love. Mm. Uh, the messages recognize with a, a kind word that Jesus loves us in the midst of our struggles, yeah. but he also sees our struggles. And he wants to help us as we struggle in this world. And every believer, I understand this. Everybody listening, we struggle in this world. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we struggle to be faithful to God. We struggle to keep up with our Bible reading and prayer. We struggle to share Christ like we want to. We struggle to love God like we would really want to. We get caught up in other things. So it's a book about believers who struggle with mm -hmm. that and how to get our minds off of this world and our minds onto the next world. But then the next two chapters, chapter four and five, are some of the greatest worship chapters mm. in all the Bible. You get this picture of heaven mm -hmm. and the elders and this glassy sea and the thrones being cast down before God and Jesus. It's just incredible, incredible chapters of worship. And some of our greatest worship songs, mm -hmm. even that we sing today, yeah. are based on those chapters. And so when when you think of the word worship, and we, I think we'll come back to this yeah. in a minute maybe, worship is a huge theme in the book of Revelation. Mm. It's all about worshiping God. It's all about focusing on God. And you have a bunch of people who are not worshiping God, they're worshiping themselves, and out of that, they give power to someone else. You're always gonna give power to someone. Mm -hmm. we, all, we all think, oh, I, I'm self-empowered, I can empower my own life. You can't, you're just, a, you're just one person. You can't possibly do it. <laughs> Even if you were perfect, you couldn't possibly do it. But what happens is we give power to someone and they give power to this beast, to this antichrist, to this one who seems powerful, who seems to be able to give them what they want, mm -hmm. but he won't in the end. He'll fall in the end. Mm. 
How have, so it seems like in culture, there's this fascination with end times, with, uh, with apocalypse. We see this in books and movies. We see this from like the left behind series. There was the Omega code movies, just all these things that are trying to basically live out what people idea or ideate is for, for revelation. So how do you think that uh, a culture's, uh, fascination with it has impacted how we read this book now? Well, I I think a lot of the fascination is because we want to figure it out. Mm -hmm. We want to know. It's like a puzzle that we're trying to, yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, well, it's not just a puzzle. We're afraid. Oh, sure. We have fears. Everybody fears the unknown. Mm -hmm. And if I could figure it out, if I knew what was going to happen, who was going to do this, and before the news headlines came out, this is what's going to happen. If I knew all of that, I feel like I could deal with my, my fears. Mm. But there's another way the book of Revelation points us to dealing with our fears. And it's not figuring it out. It's knowing God's plan, yeah. knowing God's greater plan, that God has it figured out. That's what the book of Revelation is telling us. Mm. God has it all figured out. And in the end, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth so I can put my hope in him. Mm-hmm. That's where I stand. I, I, I think maybe it might be good, because I don't want to lose time to do this. Take us wherever you want to go, uh, Tom. To, to really go to the end of the book okay. now. Great. I, I know we're going to talk no, about a few fine. more things. <laughs> but there's three commands at the end of the book yeah. that really help you as you read the whole of the book. So at the end of the book, book of Revelation, angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. And then listen to this. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. So there's three commands at the end of Revelation about what we should do. And one of them is keep these words. Yeah. Not figure out these words. <laughs> this is to be lived. The book, one of the problems we have with the book of Revelation is we try to read it differently than we read the whole rest of the Bible. Mm. When you read the whole rest of the Bible, it's, I'm, I'm reading this to live this. When I, leave, when I read in Romans 12 that, I, that we're supposed to be a living sacrifice, I think about how am I supposed to be a living sacrifice? It's not about somebody else. Yeah. It's about me. Well, the book of Revelation is about you. How are you supposed to keep these words. So how, how do you keep the words of the book of Revelation? How do, how do you practice what's read? Because he says, if you do that, you'll be blessed. Mm. And everybody's listened to this. I mean, we all, we yeah. want to be blessed. Well, the blessing comes from practicing the truth that's revealed. And, and the blessing is in living the truth of the book of Revelation. So what is that truth? Well, you know that the book of Revelation pictures Jesus as the lamb, mm-hmm. the lamb of God who was slain for the forgiveness of our sins. Just like the Passover lamb was slain in the Old Testament, Jesus became our Passover lamb, slain once for all so we could be forgiven. How do you live the book of Revelation? You worship the lamb. Mm. You put your hope in the lamb. And you put your hope in the lamb by anticipating the reign and the return of the lamb. That's what you do. Mm. You don't try to figure it out. You stand on what you know to be true. And that's why Revelation is written. Look, no matter what is thrown against this world, all these bowls of wrath, no mm. matter what happens, the lamb's going to reign in the end. Mm. So we can, we can worship him. So you keep the words. Then verse 10 says, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. So the second command is don't seal up the words. Now that personally means don't seal up your heart. Mm. I think a lot of people have said, fine, let, let theologians look at Revelation because <laughs> there's been so much confusion about it. Sure, But if you can go to what the pictures of Revelation are, don't seal up your heart against the hope that God wants to give you. There is a kind of hope that lies to yourself and says everything's going to work out okay in the end. Mm-hmm. God gives you a greater hope. And it, it is this hope that even though this world is going to fall apart in the end, you have a hope in this world, even as it's falling apart, and outside of this world as you're perfect in all of eternity. That's the hope that you stand on. Nothing can take your hope away from you. Do not settle for a circumstantial hope mm. as a Christian. That's no hope at all. That's just a wish, actually. Yeah. Stand on the hope that's going to last through 
everything that's thrown against this world in Revelation, every beast, every horn, every power, <laughs> every locust. It's, God's going to win in the end, and that is our eternal hope. So don't seal up your heart against that hope. Yeah. And then finally, he says and repeats something we just talked about a minute yeah. ago. In verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I'd heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who'd been showing them to me. But he said to me, do not do it. I am your fellow servant with you and with our brothers and the prophets and all who kept the words of this book. And then these two words, the angel says, this is the command, mm. worship God, worship God. So the vital attitude for all of us as we read the book of Revelation is worship. You come, you come with this attitude of worship. And let me say it a different way. Yeah. Not worry, but worship. Mm -hmm. Too many of us come to Revelation with worry on our minds. I want to figure it out. I want to feel better about this world. And I've, I've even noticed a lot of the, there, there are some good second coming books. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to mention any by <laughs> name. Uh, but I've noticed that some of them actually create more worry than mm -hmm. fear than worship of God. And the book of Revelation, the truths of this book, are to lead us to worship God. Worry is when you read the book of Revelation to find the answers to your worries about the future, to feel okay uh, with your uncomfort in not knowing everything that's going to happen. But worship is the attitude that unlocks this understanding. Worship is knowing that these two words, worship God, are at the center of the book of Revelation. And just, I mean, just think, the, the one who made the heavens and the earth wrote this book for us mm -hmm. to let us know in broad strokes what's going to happen at the end of time. Mm -hmm. There's a famous story about Billy Graham uh, that he talks about the book of Revelation. He's in some art museum in Europe, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit of an impressionistic uh, painting. Mm -hmm. And he's standing like, you know, inches from it, trying to see what it means. <laughs> And his wife, Ruth, is with him, and he says, I, didn't, I can't figure this out. And she says to him, just step back. Mm -hmm. Just step back, and you'll be able to take it in. And when he stepped back, he could see what the, the whole picture was. Mm. And Billy Graham writes about this. I won't get the quote exactly right. Sure. It's just coming out of my mind. But he says, for too long, we've tried to figure out every star and every <laughs> bowl and every horse in the book of Revelation, and we've missed the big picture message, which is God's hope, even in the midst of devastating times. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you who are listening, if you are approaching Revelation for maybe the first time, do so with this knowledge, do so with this conviction that I, I'm excited to read this book of worship, this book of hope, this message that God has had for all believers from the time when John wrote this to the churches and, and that he, it continues to be passed down by God to you to, to inspire this, that I am able to look ahead, not with worry, but with hope. Yes. Yes. Mm. I, I, I love, I love that encouragement for people because again, it can be, it can be scary and confusing if you've, if you go into it unprepared. And so, and so being able That's to why focus the book on is written, yeah. Jesus, Jesus says, I want you to be prepared. I mm. want you to be ready for me to come again. Now we're not going into second coming theology in this. And I don't think we will about <laughs> the thing about the rapture and how there's God other places I can church. point to in that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like foundations. Is exactly. Great to listen to. It's online and it's free. Yeah. And uh, Kay and I teach about this, yeah. but we're, we're focusing on the book of revelation mm -hmm. and what it has to say. So I, I think it might be good to talk about the tribulation. Great, okay. Because I think that's really, uh, for a lot of people, uh, disconcerting. Sure. Might be a good word. Scares me to death <laughs> might be a different word for some people. So what I'd like to do is just take a quick look together at one of the sections of Revelation that talks about the tribulation is, is Revelation 14. Okay. And let me just give you the broad strokes of what you see in Revelation 14, mm -hmm. as the world is going through this, this time of tribulation, in the midst of this, here's some things that you see, what God is doing in the midst of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. In the midst of the tribulation, you see a lamb that's leading worship. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, read those chapters, Revelation 14, 15, 16. Yeah. You're going to see a lamb that's leading worship. And it's a reminder that when life isn't fair, 
or when your world is falling apart, one day our sorrows are going to be turned into songs. Mm. Well, I need that when I've got sorrows. Mm. And that's what you see in the book of Revelation in times of tribulation. In these same chapters, you see angels announcing the truth. In the midst of the tribulation, you've got an angels that are keeping on announcing the truth. And it's a reminder that when life isn't fair, one day we will rest from all our labor because that's what the angels keep announcing. A time of rest is coming. This is not the end. God has something more. In, in these same chapters, you see a harvest that is coming. They're not just chapters about the end. The, the reason that the end is coming is because a harvest is coming. God is bringing in all of his people. When life isn't fair, remember, one day God's going to settle the books. In this harvest, those who are evil will be judged, and those who have trusted Christ will be with him for all eternity. And if you just look at this world, it doesn't look that way. If you just look at this world, it looks like evil is winning many times. Mm. The book of Revelation says, get your eyes off of just the here and now. Yeah. Get your eyes on the broad strokes of what, what God is doing. And then the part that really gets us, you got these bowls of wrath that are mm -hmm. going to be poured out in chapter 15 and 16. When life isn't fair, remember, one day evil will be overcome. Because those bowls of wrath, God's wrath is poured out against evil. He's not going to allow it to continue. There will be no evil in heaven. That's why you get Revelation 21 and 22. That's why you get no more sorrow, no mm -hmm. more crying, no more death or any such thing. Because God has poured out his wrath against all evil and destroyed it and thrown it into the lake of fire mm -hmm. so that we will enjoy being in God's presence forever. Now, we'd like to have a world where God didn't have to deal with evil and it just all got better. Yeah. That's not real. Mm -hmm. Evil has to be dealt with. Yeah. And God is powerful enough. And when it's his time, he will have no problem dealing with it because he's the God of the universe. Mm. I, I love that reminder that, that uh, another theme in this is justice and that yes. you see that, in, that, that God is a God of justice, that God is just. And while we may not fully understand what that means and what that looks like, we can have trust and faith in a God who is just to exhibit and demonstrate that justice in the way that he evil. has seen is Yeah, is and you, and you, you know, many of you know, listen to this, that the Bible tells us Jesus is the justifier yeah. of everyone who has faith in him. So I'm not just before God. No one can be. But I'm trusting in Jesus, mm -hmm. not in my good works. You know, so I can't even become just by my own good works. Yeah. Uh, and the Bible reveals to us that many of those good works are, are motivated by selfishness. Mm -hmm. and, and you might even know this as a believer in Christ. Are some of your good works ever motivated by selfishness? <laughs> Mine sure are. Yeah. You know, I'd like to get in good with my wife by doing the dishes. <laughs> sure. you know? I mean, there is a little self. I just have to admit it. So we've all got some of that in us. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, those who are without God, uh, even if they have good works, uh, it's what do people think of me? Or maybe they even want to be their own God at times mm. and have people look at them uh, in ways that are not healthy for this world or their world. Mm. And God will, in the end, judge every hidden motive of the heart. That's a scary verse for me, except for the fact that I'm trusted in Jesus, yeah. who has gone into every part of my heart and cleansed it by the power of the cross. That's a very big except, yes. right? Yes, it is. <laughs> So one thing that we've been looking at through this Navigating the Bible series, too, is looking at parallels and helping people see how the Bible speaks to itself. So what was help, what other parts of the Bible specifically would be helpful to know for somebody who's maybe jumping into Revelation for the first time? <laughs> all, Besides all of it. All of it. That, there's a reason that Revelation <laughs> is last. So unless you understand all of it, sure. you don't understand it. <laughs> Mm. You, unless you understand the prophets of the Old Testament, you don't understand the pictures mm. that are in the book of Revelation because so many of those pictures come from those prophets. Yeah. And unless you understand the teaching of the New Testament, you don't understand the truth about who Jesus is. Mm. When you read about a lamb, sure. what does it mean if you haven't read that, that Jesus was our Passover lamb? If you haven't read that at in the Gospels yeah. that it was at the time of the Passover that he gave his life for us on the cross. And you haven't read in the letters of Paul 
that he is our Passover lamb. He is our Passover bread. Mm -hmm. And so really, Book of Revelation, I always say <laughs> to people, it's at the end for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if you understand the rest, you will understand Revelation better. I know a lot of people want to read it first. And Why? <laughs> hope, hopefully it leads you into reading the rest. Yeah. Hopefully it leads you into reading the rest. <laughs> It's those people who start at the end of the mystery exactly. novel to see how it's solved and then go back to watch how it yes. was solved. No, no, you have to, you know, you won't catch all of the people, you know, you won't know who's talking, what's, who are these people are unless you have read through it. So no, that's, that's, that, that's a good word for this. Now for people who may have just picked up the new Testament and maybe they're starting reading the, the new Testament by itself, you know, starting there before going back to the old Testament, it, you mentioned, especially with the prophets, in painting that picture of of prophetic imagery. Yes. Are yes. there are there any other pieces about the Old Testament specifically that I, you want to call out to say, like, if you haven't read the Old Testament, let me just tell you about this before you read Revelation. No, I think the prophets are where to Great. read. And you, if you read Daniel and mm -hmm. you read the minor prophets you're gonna get a lot of these pictures and see how God uses these pictures. Mm -hmm. Be very helpful. They're called the minor prophets, not because they were lesser prophets, because the books are all shorter. Yes. <laughs> so you, and Daniel's a pretty short book as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, you'll enjoy reading the book of Daniel uh, because if you haven't, because yeah. there's so much of the picture of his life as a faithful man before God. We've all heard of Daniel in the lion's den and know the end of that story. Yeah. If you don't, you got to read the book <laughs> <laughs> to know the end of that story. But there's also a lot of pictures of how God was going to work in the world yeah. and some, uh, some powers that were going to come into the world, which looking back on it, we can see what those were. Yeah. Looking forward, Daniel couldn't see it yet. But looking back on it, we can see how God was at work. And the same thing is going to be true of the book of Revelation, I believe. Mm -hmm. mm. So uh, I want you, you, you've given us such great encouragement and advice and just, just it kind of I, uh, hopefully for everybody listening, you're more excited now to read Revelation than maybe you were. Maybe you were most excited to get to Revelation because you were anticipating just wanting to parse through everything. But now I hope that there's a different kind of excitement that yes. you're excited to see this this vast letter, this calling of hope, this the, this reminder that God is in control, that this is his story. Yeah, and that in that he 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 has made us to be a part of it. But this is his story. He is the author of it. He's the author of life, and that is true for all of eternity to come. And whatever is going to come um, in this world, yes, he, yes, he, we have his authorship in that. Yeah, <laughs> it is a book uh, that's all about hope. That's the key. But. I said this earlier, but mm -hmm. maybe let me repeat it now as sure. we're towards an end. Yes, I, well, it's, it's, and, and that's my last question for you: is what other, is there a final encouragement that you want to give, Jason? People? We've so there worked we go. long enough. I knew where you were going, <laughs> so I was answering in advance. It's a book about real hope. Yeah, and all of us have to admit we have some measure of false hope in our lives as believers, mm -hmm. uh, because we hope in this world too much. We put too much faith in this world that's not going to last. But the world is right there. It's right in front of us. And things are going great in my family or things are going great in my church. Wherever things are going great, it's right close to us. So we tend to put hope in our circumstances. Circumstances just means, the word literally means standing around. Mm -hmm. Circum, around, yeah. stance, standing. It's just the stuff that's hanging around in your life. And tomorrow something different's going to be hanging around and it might not be as good. But we all are tempted into putting our hope in our circumstances. And Revelation, the challenge of it, and why it's hard to read sometimes, is it challenges me to transfer my hope, make this transfer from the things in this world that aren't going to last to the eternity of God, to the plan of God that is going to last. So he says, look, things are going to fall apart sometimes. You still have hope. Don't think that took your hope away from you. And more than anything, we haven't talked about this, mm. but more than anything, he says, your hope is in Jesus Christ. One of the wonderful things about the book of Revelation is these pictures of Jesus. You know, I mean, we watch The Chosen and get wonderful sure. pictures of Jesus the man. And that's very helpful, very helpful. But that should not be our only picture of Jesus. Mm. 
You also need a revelation picture of Jesus, these white robes, this glowing face, like the glowing face that the disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mm -hmm. even when he was on this earth. This powerful Jesus, this, this Jesus who is above and beyond anything in this world. We need that picture of Jesus in our world today. Mm. Because if not, some celebrity in this world can look more powerful to us. Mm. Some circumstance in this world or opportunity in this world can look more wonderful to us. And Revelation is saying, look at who Jesus is. Look at where Jesus is. Look at how powerful he is. Holy, holy, holy. We're going to be singing for all of, all of eternity. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. That's what, We're going to sing this for all eternity because of his power. Mm-hmm. And if I can just get a glimpse of that in this world, it helps to transfer my hope. So I'd encourage you, if this is your first reading through the book of Revelation, more than anything, look for the pictures of Jesus mm. in the book of Revelation and do what do the command at the end, yeah. worship him all the way through the book. Mm. Well, Tom, thank you. If you want to hear Tom talk even more through the book of Revelation, I'm going to put the links to Drive Time Devotions in there where Tom goes through every chapter of the book of of Revelation and talks through it. And and you'll hear the words hope a lot in it because that is the key theme there. So Tom, thank you so much for helping us navigate through Oh, a joy to be here and talk about this (laughs) and uh, praying for everybody who's listening. And I know some of you, when I talk about hope, you really need it today. Mm. You're really going through a tough time and things are not good. Things are not good. The news that you just got or what just happened or what's going on with your kids or your job or... You just desperately need hope right now. And my prayer is that first you'll know that there's somebody who cares. God cares, and there's somebody else who'll come alongside of you to let you know how deeply God cares about what you're going through. You're not alone. But my hope is also that you will have hope, Mm. a hope that's above and beyond what you're going through right now, that God will will shine through with that light that we've been talking about, because we do care about you and what you're going through. Mm. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate you. Now let's look at some next steps out of this episode. Oh man, did Tom have a great, lots of great insight to help us navigate Revelation. I mentioned this near the end of the conversation, but if you want to go deeper, listen to Drive Time Devotions where Tom goes through Revelation a chapter a week, five days a week. You can also check out foundations the second coming for a deep dive on the doctrine of the second coming now there are links to both of those drive time devotions and foundations in the show notes for this episode so i want to thank my guest today tom holiday friends my name is jason this has been doable discipleship and we'll be back with you again next week If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget but to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes and go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week.